um, quantum error correction because at the end of the day, if you want to build a, a big quantum computer to run Shor's algorithm, for example, you're going to have to take one of these chips and you're going to have to make it much bigger. And on top of that, you're going to have to put error correction on it, right? So unless you have some incredibly uh, good qubits which are somehow topologically protected and that has not yet been demonstrated yet, you will need a layer of error correction to do any sort of meaningful quantum computing. And um, first I'm going to talk about the sort of overhead you need when you do error correction. And the, the, the topic of this research is how we can in implement it in a lab with fewer resources than, than what is proposed at the moment. Okay, so just a few words about quantum error correction so that we're all on the same page. Um, so um, let's take away function psi, which is in a superposition of zero and one. So zero and one are two uh, quantum states of a physical qubit. And this, let's just now focus on the fact that I want to protect the states. I want to make sure that if an error happens, I can recover the quantum state psi. I'm not going to do any operations on it. I just want to keep it alive at its same state psi. Okay. So let's assume for simplicity also that the only problem that can happen to my qubits is a bit flip error. And a bit flip error means that the zero is transformed to one and the one is transformed to zero. And this is done at a random time uh, at some moments, which is not controlled by the operator, right? So at some random time, uh, a bit flip is going to occur and you're going to have your new state, which is sigma x psi, which is you see the, the zero has been flipped to one and the one has been flipped to zero, right? And as you can see, the axes have been switched and the arrow is now red, indicating that there has been an error. So then you think, okay, what would have been nice? So the whole spirit of error correction is to say, what would have been nice if, if these two vectors here were two by two orthogonal to these ones, then, I can then I'll have a, a space of dimension four, and I can define an observable, which is, takes the value, for example, plus one when my state lives in this subspace, the value minus one when my state lives in this subspace. In error correction, we call this observable and error syndrome. And depending on the value of the error syndrome, I'll know if an error has occurred or has not occurred, right? But as you can see here, there's no chance of that happening because this subspace is exactly equal to this one. And there's no way I can define an observable which takes two different values in these two subspaces. So then the, the, the solution is quite simple. You think, okay, I just need two more dimensions, which is easy. I just need to add an extra qubit, right? So if I add an extra qubit, the dimension is now two to the two, it's four, and I'm all done. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to add a qubit. And now the, the, the wave function psi, let's encode it in this basis here, which is zero, zero for both qubits uh, in the ground state, and then one, one is, is both qubits in the excited state. And now um, an error may happen, and one uh, bit can flip, and a new wave function is this one, where you see there's an error where all the ones have been flipped to zeros, and the zeros have been flipped to ones on the first qubit. And this, is, this looks great because these two vectors are now two by two orthogonal to this one. So I can now define an observable which takes the value minus one here and plus one here, and it should be all good, right? But the problem is that since I added a qubit, that other qubits can also have errors on it. And this surely will happen, right? If, if I had a perfect qubit I could add here, I would have used it in the first place and I wouldn't go through all this, right? So you need to assume that everything you add also has errors. Um, so in this case, the other states I can jump to is this one. And unfortunately, this one is not orthogonal to this one. So I can't distinguish the three cases of no error, first bit uh, flips or second bit flips, right? So I'm, I'm still not done. I, have, I would have liked to have six dimensions, and I only have four, right? So then I add another qubit, and then I encode my state in this, in this, um, um, in this uh, superposition here. And again, we can go through all the, the possibilities. Either the bit flip one can happen, the second one can happen, or the third one can happen. Unfortunately, this time, they're all two by two orthogonal. So we've converged at n equal three physical qubits, per logical qubits, when you only have bit flip errors, right? And the reason why I'm telling you all about this is that I'm, I just want to make two points, is that when you do error correction, it's about uh, adding uh, more things to your system to make it overall better but things usually get worse first, right? Uh, and you need to assume that everything you add also has its own errors, okay? Um, okay, so, so theorists in the um, early 2000s, mid 90s, when error correction was invented, went through all the, the details of, in general, you have n qubits with three n error channels because it, you, you don't only have bit flips, but also face flips and bit and face flips. Uh, then you, you have available two to the n dimensions and, and to, to have this orthogonality constraints 
you need this number of, of qubits and this, uh, sorry, um, yeah, this number of, of, uh, of qubits and this all converge, this, this um, criteria is, is met for a minimal number of physical qubits for logical qubits of five, okay? So this sounds very reasonable. You think, okay, if I need to build a, a computer with um, a thousand qubits to beat um, a, uh, <coughs> to beat a classical computer and I need to just multiply this number by five, it's completely, uh, okay, it's, it sounds like a nightmare for us now as experimentalists, but it doesn't sound crazy, right? Um, but unfortunately, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I didn't have time to go into it, but if you now think of how you're gonna measure each error syndrome, you need to add ancillas. I'm not gonna go into this notion of fault tolerance, but there's an extra notion on top. Um, you want this high error threshold means that you want all this to start working with where the probability P of getting errors is relatively high or, or in experimental reach. You also want a low connectivity in the sense that you want your qubits to not all have to talk to each other but only, for example, nearest neighbor coupling. This is also a very ex experimental physical constraint, right? Because we make usually two-dimensional chips and qubits usually talk to the neighbors. Um, um, so all this gives you, um, you can come up with a, uh, a code which validates all these criteria, which is a surface code, which is a, a very interesting code and very popular in our community. And when you go through the numbers, uh, an order of magnitude, so this number is a really to take with caution because it depends on many things but an order of magnitudes of the order of, of thousands, if not more, physical qubits for logical qubits. And this, this is now big. It means if you want to make a, a chip, a computer with a thousand qubits, you'll need millions of qubits, of physical qubits to, to operate it. Uh, and this, for now, is, is way beyond what we know how to do, okay? So what we're trying to do in this research uh, is asking whether we can reduce the overhead that we need for error correction. Okay, and again, by overhead, I mean the number of physical qubits for logical qubits. Um, okay, so I want to get through two ideas. Um, the first one is what we call in our community the CAT code, which is about encoding quantum information in a cavity, not in qubits. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about a second notion, which is nonlinear dissipation. Okay? Um, okay, so what is the CAT code? So just a bit of background on the, the, the objects I need. So if you take a quantum harmonic oscillator, you can think of a pendulum with a small angle around, around its uh, vertical axis. Um, and its states can be represented in uh, the XP plane or in the Fresnel diagram, if you wish, if you're more familiar with, with optics. Um, and a classical oscillation, um, its quantum counterpart is a Kieran states alpha, which can be decomposed in this form here. It's a sum over all Fox states, which um, states with a specific number of photons in the cavity, in, in the oscillator, sorry, with this um, Poisson distribution here, right? And um, if you're not familiar with this, it doesn't matter. The only thing that's important here is that um, the coherent states alpha, uh, eigenstates of the annihilation operator with an eigenvalue alpha, okay? Um, and A uh, is the annihilation operator for this harmonic oscillator. Okay, so since this is quantum mechanics, when you have one state and you can make another, you can add them and you have another state, right? The set of states is a, is a linear vector space. So you can define the states which oscillates with a plus phase and a minus here, and you can add them together. And this is what we call a cat state because it's in a superposition of two, in quotes, macroscopic states, okay? Um, and you can decompose it over Fox states and you'll find that it only has even number of Fox states which are populated. And this is usually why we call it a even state. It's an even photon number state. Okay, so now um, this picture here is not very good to represent such quantum states. A much better way is to plot what we call a Wigner function. And a Wigner function, there's basically a one-to-one -one correspondence between a Wigner function and a quantum state, okay? So you could either, so if you, if you usually think of a quantum state as a wave function, this is also a representation of the wave function of a, a usually used for an electromagnetic field, okay? And the reason why we like Wigner functions, first of all, it gives pretty pictures, but more seriously is because it, it's, it, since this expression is true, this is something we can actually measure in the laboratory, okay? And uh, the fact that you have fringes here is an indication that you have a coherent superposition between these two states, okay? So this is why it's a, it's a nice representation. Um, okay, so you can also flip this sign and you get a minus sign, uh, sorry, um, uh, yeah, minus sign here, and now it's the odd number states which are populated, and if you look between in the two Wigners, the difference is simply that the fringes have changed um, signs. Okay. Becky, yes. Could you just say what D, D, D is? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So this this is um, sort of yeah. So 
the, the, the reason I wrote this is because, so D is actually a displacement of, of the state of some amount beta. And um, just for those of you who do experiments, you'll probably notice that this is something which is measurable because D is simply an impulse, a microwave pulse that we send in our cavity. And then E to the I pi A, a is a, a parity number measurement that we know how to make, but I'm, I'm also not going to go into those details. Yeah, but D is just a displacement operator. Okay, so let's talk about loss now. Uh, if you t another, so I, I showed a pendulum, but you can also have a, an oscillator made out of an LC oscillator, which is just an inductor and power with a capacitor. And um, usually this is coupled to an environment, so, right, whether you want it or not, unfortunately, um, which we model by a capacitor coupled to a, to a transmission line, right? Um, this, uh, this loss is, is modeled by a loss operator, a jump operator L, which is equal to this square root of kappa. Kappa is the rate at which energy leaves your system into the environment, and A is the inhalation operator. And if we look at what this loss does, um, what it does is that if you take the first two Fox states, zero and one, it, it collapses the one state, so the zero state, at some rate kappa, okay? Um, and you think, okay, um, this, is you, this is a bit like the sort of, it's, it's a sort of a similar to the bit flip errors, it's not the same because one goes to zero and zero goes to zero. It's not a, not a, a bit flip, but it's in, in some sense similar. But now if, if I want to do error correction and use more states in my Hilbert space, then you think, okay, this is, this is easy. I'll just, you know, harmonic oscillator is an infinite dimensional system. It has many, many levels. Why don't I just use all the other available states to encode information? And this is exactly what we have in mind. We have all these four states, for example. Um, and you see what is, you see that the rate to go from two to one or three to two or four to three scales with the number, right? So then it sounds like a terrible idea. You're like, okay, you had initially two states, zero and one, with some problem that happened at a rate kappa, and now you're going to explore states which have a, a much bigger rate, right? That sounds like a terrible idea. But remember again that this is the idea of using more states to correct for errors, right? So you, we need, we need to, to to encode our information in more states in order to be able to redundantly encode information and correct for this. So this is a price we actually have to pay, okay? Fortunately though, um, in contrast to the qubit case, we're not adding more error channels, right? It's still only the A operator that's acting on our system. It's not because you go to the fourth state that you have some new mechanism that decays you from four to, to two or something else, right? And, um, and, and this actually, this approximation is very well validated in, in um, oscillators and specifically in our field and we've measured cavities with, with uh, very, very small kappas and tried to detect other sources of errors when the cavity is on its own. We could not detect other sources of errors than this kappa here, okay? Okay, so basically the point is that we have more dimensions so we can redundantly encode information. We do have more dissipation but no more, not more error channels. So now, here's the, the main idea, is that with this in mind, let's think of defining the logical zero state as this even cat state, which is this horizontal state like this, or this superposition where alpha is real, okay? Now, the one state is gonna be this, um, what we sometimes call the, the vertical cat state, which is just like this one, where, where this alpha now is a pure imaginary, and it's along the vertical axis of my Wigner plane, okay? And um, the idea, again, is to have your anyway function as the sum of this C0 and, uh, sorry, 0L and, and 1L, right? So now let's go through um, what, what the, the, the main point is, is that now if you define any state psi as some superposition of C alpha plus and C plus I alpha, so again, this superposition here, I'm plotting the Wigner function of this state where C0 equals C1 equals 1 over root 2, okay? Um, so this now forms a two-dimensional Hilbert space that I'm representing in a block sphere. And at some uh, random time, you're going to have a photon loss um, uh, error, which is going to map you, which is, well, which is going to make, uh, so the, the result of that is that your new state psi 1 is A times psi 0, which is this one here where you see the pluses have turned into minuses, and you get an extra I here, okay? So now you're, you're in a, a odd, um, uh, photon number state, and uh, this is very fortunate because now if you measure parity, you can distinguish between this case and this case, okay? And then you know that an error has happened and you have learned nothing about C0 and C1, which is good because you don't want to destroy your information, you just want to know whether an error has occurred or not. So then at some later time, another jump can happen and then you jump into even parity again, 
And you can detect that by, again, tracking parity and, and, and so on, and then it loops around, okay? Uh, now, there's an extra effect that I'm going to discuss a bit later, is that if this keeps happening, the amplitude here decays um, exponentially towards zero, and of course, at the end of the day, you just land in a vacuum, okay? And this is a problem I'm going to address in my second part of the talk. Um, but if we just, for now, forget about this problem and look on short time scales, we can still do the experiment. Um, we can still do the experiments, and the experiments look like this. We put our samples in um, big uh, dilution refrigerators. So this is basically a fridge. You see the scale here. Um, the, the point of this fridge is that it takes us down to very low temperatures of the order of 10 millikelvin. The reason why we need to go so low is, first of all, we use superconductors that need to, which have a TC, a, a critical temperature around one, kel one kelvin. So we need to go below that. And second of all, we have um, electromagnetic modes, which are around 5 gigahertz. 5 to 10 gigahertz, so we need to be much below the, 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 the temperature so that they're not thermally populated, and that turns out to be below 100 millikelvins, okay? So with 10 millikelvin, we're, we're, we're fine. Um, and then we have to do all sorts of magnetic and radiation shielding um, at the bottom of the fridge to shield our systems from the outside world, okay? So that their, um, their lifetimes are as long as possible. Um, now, inside, so in, inside these boxes, this is what, what is going on. We have a um, sample. So this is not ex the, so the samples that I'm going to show you, um, uh, so sorry, the experiments I'm going to show you were not all taken with this sample, but with samples very similar. Um, so you, you usually have two cavities here. So this is the microwave oscillator that I've been talking about for now. It's as long, long lived as you can make it. It's just a box, okay? And uh, a, a box forms a cavity, and the cavity actually holds electromagnetic modes, which are a quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay, so this is basically our pendulum. Um, in between these two cavities, we have a sapphire chip here with uh, two antennas, one reaching in each uh, cavity, uh, and um, a, a Josephson junction in between uh, the two electrodes. So a Josephson junction is, if I zoom here and go down to a few tens of nanometer scale. Uh, you see that a Josephson junction is um, uh, simply a two superconducting electrodes separated by a very thin insulating bar barrier. And in our case, this insulating barrier is just a few atomic layers of aluminum oxide. It's about around 10 atomic layers of aluminum oxide. Um, okay, I'll, I'll get into a bit later. So the reason why we need the, this, this cavity here is, for instance, to, to read, um, to, to measure the Wigner function of this, the, this one here that I've been talking about. Okay, um, so here's a sort of a history of the experimental results which were taken with these, this sort of device. So, okay, first of all, there was this theoretical prediction back in 2013, and then um, immediately after, actually, um, in a group of Rolf Scholkoff, they were able to show that uh, you could indeed encode, so this is experimental data, you can indeed encode a, a quantum state in a superposition of uh, these um, cat states. So here's an even state, and here's a superposition of, uh, sorry, here's a real cat state and here's a superposition of the um, real and, and imaginary cat state, if you want. Um, then, as I explained earlier, you need to um, track the parity of the state in order to detect when error ha have happened. And this is actually why we needed this extra cavity to do the measurement. Um, this is shown here where you see a trace of parity versus time. You see the scale here is microseconds. And you see your odd, odd, odd. And at some point, you lose a photon, you're even. You lose another first on your R, you lose another first on your even, and so on. Um, this was in 2014. And then since more recently, we were able to show that um, using this and encoding and this parity tracking, uh, we could indeed um, uh, protect information. Um, uh, so let me show you uh, this. So this is the, um, um, uh, the, the red dots here. You see the, the, uh, so the, x, the y axis is the fidelity uh, with respect to your initial state, let's say. And here is time. So ideally, if you have no, no errors at all, you just have a horizontal uh, line. It's um, fidelity equal one, OK? Now, since you do have loss, this fidelity is not conserved. It, it goes down. And if you do some level of correction, you get this, these red dots, right? Now, if you do the simplest thing you can think of um, is just to, um, to encode your information in the zero and one states of your um, oscillator without doing any parity measurements, without in, doing anything like that you get these gray dots here. And the, the main, the, sorry, the, the sort of uh, breakthrough in this work was that we were able to make this uh, red line a little bit, 10% less steep 
than the gray line, okay? So this sounds like um, maybe a little bit um, marginal if, if we're not used to this, but um, the, usually in, in, uh, in experimental physics, the, the, the more you make something complicated, the worse it works in general, right? So the problem with error correction is that it's all about making things more complicated and hoping that things will work better, right? And before this experiment, it had never actually worked out that you do all sorts of encoding and tracking of errors and, 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 and corrections and all this, and things get actually better. And this was the first time that things got maybe a little bit better, but still, still uh, uh, better. <laughs> so, um, okay, so now there's a question, like I told you um, um, during the, the introduction, is that when you add things to your system, these new things come with their own problems, right? So when I added more qubits, those qubits had their own bit flip error rates, right? So for us, we have exactly the same problem, is that in order to track parity, for example, this is an, an error syndrome I'm measuring, I needed to add stuff. I added a cavity, I added a qubit. So the question is, did we add more uh, error channels by doing this? And okay, so unfortunately the answer is yes. When you take a memory, a very, very good memory, and you couple it to a qubit and a readout cavity, what you can show is that if the qubit is a little bit hot, uh, the cavity dephasing rate is going to start being non-zero, or, or at least measurable, right? Um, if you don't have a qubit or anything, the, the, in a 3D cavity, the frequency is fixed by boundary conditions of a metallic, rigid metallic box, right? So the frequency is extremely stable. We could never see it fluctuate, okay? Um, of course, it, it, it changes when you go from room temperature to base temperature, but as long as you're cold and everything's contracted to their equilibrium temperature, it's fixed and, and doesn't move, and we could not measure it fluctuate. In this experiment, we're, the, 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 the authors were able to show that this is not the case with the qubit. If the qubit is hot, your cavity dephasing rate will increase, okay? And this is an error that I had not accounted for initially in the discussion about encoding and cat states and so on. So is this a problem? Yes, it is. And this now is going to bring me to my second part is how we're going to fight this problem and, and actually uh, suppress the phasing, uh, hopefully completely. Um, <clears throat> okay. So now um, let's uh, lo look at our oscillator again, but this time it's not an oscillator that I prepare and measure stroboscopically. It's an oscillator which is this pendulum here, and I'm going to actively drive it and have it dissipate. Okay, so now it's a, an active system which is both driven and dissipative. Um, so there's, yeah, there's some drive and there's some dissipation which is rep represented by this gray fluid here. <clears throat> and its states, again, can, is a, its steady states will be represented by some points in XP plane. Um, if you drive it to the Hamiltonian, it will be of this form. It's a superposition of, it's a sum, sorry, of A and A dagger. So just a current drive. And there's a loss operator, which in the most trivial case, um, and inevitably will have this form, uh, which is just at some rate kappa one, you lose photons one by one, or in other words, you have this loss operator. And the steady state you're going to reach will be a composition or a ratio between how hard you're driving and how hard you're dissipating, okay? Um, um, okay, so now the question we're, on, we're asking is, is um, somewhat academic for now, and we'll see how it relates to the story later, is, is there a way I can drive a system um, such that its steady states is not a single steady state, but a whole manifold of steady states, okay? So what you'd need is, yeah, some special drive, some special dissipation, uh, such that not only this state is a steady state not, uh, and this one, but any superposition of the two is also a steady state. So it turns out that it, this does exist, and this is the solution, is that if you now drive your system with a Hamiltonian, or you have a Hamiltonian which is quadratic now in A and A dagger, it's A squared plus A dagger squared, and you have a loss operator, so this in quantum optics is known as squeezing, okay, and it's been known for a long time. Um, um, the, the lo which is what is less familiar is this loss operator here, where you um, uh, annihilate photons in pairs, okay? Um, now, in, in this case, um, like I said, this state here, just this one will be a steady state. This one will also be a steady state, but any superposition of the two will also be a steady state. And exactly in the same analog, in an analog fashion to the other case, alpha is also a competition between how hard you're driving and how hard you're dissipating. Okay? So you can generalize this. So I think there are some mathematician theorists in the room, so I, I put this in. Just There's a, a, an interesting thing you can generalize where you just have a power n here, and you can have n n-dimensional steady states. 
uh, for practical reasons, we're having a hard time getting this uh, power four here in the lab. So I'm going to focus on the case uh, of two. Okay. Um, so again, the, we're going to use um, a similar type, so the, the same devices I showed earlier to do this experiment. This is just a reminder of what it looks like. Um, and um, uh, here's how the different modes are displayed in the frequency spectrum. Uh, so this is the, the spectrum of the various modes. You have a qubit mode, uh, so which is the antenna mode here, which we call the qubit. The mode which lives in this left cavity is called the storage. We call it like this. And the, the, cavity, the mode which lives in the right cavity is called the, um, the uh, readout mode. So here are the three frequencies here. And you see the fact that the readout mode is uh, lossy is shown on this uh, graphic by this large um, width here, kappa. Okay? And the storage one is as, as, as narrow as we can make it, but it always has some intrinsic loss, and that's life. Um, okay, so now we're going to drive the, um, the we're going to now pump this system. So I told you it's a, a, a driven dissipative system. So now I'm, it's dissipative because of this readout mode here. And it's going to be driven because I'm actively going to pump it with a current tone at this specific frequency. And the great thing with the Josephson junction is that it, 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 it's uh, somewhat like a nonlinear crystal, which, um, which um, enables four wave mixing. Okay? So um, the, what, it, what it does, for instance, um, if you match this frequency matching condition, uh, let's say, perfectly, it will simulate, this pump will simulate processes which absorb two photons in the storage mode and emits one pump photon and one readout photon. But you see, since the readout photon is very lossy, it will immediately leave into the transmission line. And this makes this process um, somewhat irreversible, right? Because when you create two photons here, they leave. But there are never enough photons around in the readout mode for the reverse process to happen, OK? And this gives you this interaction Hamiltonian. It's a three-body mixing term here, because the pump amplitude is now in this G2. Um, and if you do what we call an adiabatic elimination of the readout mode, you recover what we wanted, which is the annihilation of photons in pairs of the storage mode, right? And you can see graphically, it's, it's, it's pretty, I hope, clear that um, y y by adding this pump, you're, you're, um, you're sort of building a path for these storage photons to combine emit these pairs of photons. And as soon as they emit a readout, it leaves. And effectively, you're just pumping two photons in pairs from the storage mode. OK, you can now uh, enhance the reverse process, which is not exactly the same. But you add a drive resonant with the readout mode. And what, what this will do when you add this, this driving term here is exactly the squeezing term you want. So you're injecting photons in pairs, and you're also removing them in pairs, right? So this is what we did in the lab. So let's go through um, some data. So here, um, what I'm plotting here is uh, the uh, real and imaginary axis of, um, of the IQ plane. Uh, the pink dots here are the location of the two steady states, plus and minus alpha. Uh, and um, the red disk here is the initial state I'm going to start from before switching on all this pumping and then seeing what I obtain 10 microseconds later. OK, so let's start here. I start here, I wait, and then I take a Wigner tomography uh, measurement um, after 10 microseconds. So this is data now. And you have the real and imaginary axis. The, f the fact, so if you're not familiar with Wigner functions, just know that the fact that you have a lot of red here means the population is located in the left section of the IQ plane, in this, around this well here. Okay? Um, and now I can start from here, and then wait, and then I get this. And it's already interesting to see that um, despite the fact that I started from two different states, I, uh, I um, converged to the same state. Okay? So this is clearly not a unitary um, operation that's going on, right? This is, yeah, it's clearly non, non unitary. Um, then again, I'm going to start from yet another, another state, and I'm going to again fall in this left well. Um, and I can start in the middle, and, and you can see that you have some population here and some population here. Um, and we understand, we at least think we understand this bias towards the left because of what we call the Kerr effect. Um, and then you can start in here, and this time you fall on the right. So there's something non trivial going on. It's just, um, it's not a, just a, a sort of a usual dissipative system that has one steady state. It already has two steady states, right? 
Um, so you can continue the experiment and show that depending on where you start, you either converge to one steady state or the other, or some superposition of the two, uh, uh, for, or some classical mixture of the two. Okay. Now, if you look at the um, a sort of um, meta potential where the color here is the magnitude of the velocity of a classical state, which is at this point in IQ space. Um, so green means I'm moving fast, and white means I'm I, my velocity is zero. So white means I'm at a steady state. Uh, I can also plot these trajectories, which show that if I start on the right part of the IQ plane, I'll fall into the right well. If I start on the left part, I'll fall into the left uh, well. And if I and here you see a saddle point. Okay, so a saddle point is a uh, it's a, it's an unstable um, uh, state of equilibrium, right? So the question is, what will happen if if I initialize my system here? So this is now. So we were hunting for quantum features. So then we made all our pictures uh, with higher resolutions and more averaging and all this. So this is data here. This is a reconstruction of the data using, um, um, using a maximum likel likelihood algorithm. And this is numerical simulations with independently measured parameters. So time equals zero, where the saddle point, which is the vacuum. And the fact that you see a spread here is because of vacuum fluctuations. Right? This is, um, in principle, it's a very cold cavity. So this here, uh, this um, standard deviation here is entirely due to, to shot noise or to vacuum fluctuations. So now after some um, two microseconds, you see that the state is, is stretched. You can see it's reaching for the two steady states, but it's not quite sure which way it should go. Um, and if you wait a bit longer, after seven microseconds, it does reach the two steady states. And the interesting feature here is these two very small, but barely below the noise, um, uh, dips here below zero, right? And you can see in the reconstruction they're much more visible and in, the in, in reasonable agreement with what we expected, right? And this shows that we have, in principle, built an, a non-trivial dissipation mechanism where we do fall, fall in, in, in two wells at the same time rather than just one or the other, right? Um, and now if you wait long enough, everything disappears because you inevitably have this single photon loss which kills everything eventually. Okay, so um, um, now this was in 2015. A few years later, um, um, we went from a ratio of kappa 2 to kappa. So kappa 2 is the, the rate at which we dissipate photons in pairs. Kappa is the rate at which we just dissipate into an un uncontrolled environment. We went from a ratio of 1 to a ratio of about 100, and things got prettier. Um, so this, again, is, is measured with Wigner uh, uh, tomography, where the, the real imaginary axis. And it, it got, this ratio was large enough that we could um, attempt another experiment, which was to, um, once you've converged into this manifold of steady states, to manipulate the state within this manifold of steady states. Okay? So this is what we did here, for example, is where we started from this even cat state. And you see we've displaced it up. You see the fringes are a little bit moving up with respect to this one here. Right? Um, and the, the, the blobs here are pretty much at the same place. And here we did the same thing where we started from a, an odd uh, cat state and we also displayed the fringes. So this is a somewhat, a, a, this is a, um, analog to a um, quantum Zeno effect where you have a, a, a competition between a dissipation and a drive, but where the dissipation now doesn't confine you to one state but to a manifold of states. So you can really have oscillations within this manifold of states. Um, okay, so, um, Let's get back to this dephasing problem. Um, it, it, we were able to show in, in, uh, in theory that um, in, uh, in, in uh, the regime where kappa 2 is the dominant um, energy scale or rate in the system, then you should have this uh, incredible scaling, which is the, the gamma phi, which is the dephasing rate. So in our case, it will dominantly be because we've polluted our perfect cavity with qubits and readout resonators and all sorts of stuff. So this gamma phi is finite because of all the overhead we've added. Uh, and, but you see the pumping, the fact of having this two photon pumping and so on, in the correct regime, should exponentially suppress this gamma phi. And we, we, like, we very much like exponential scaling because, right, I mean, if, if this is, so if we're able to show this in practice, if you want a gamma phi of, one over gamma phi of an hour, you'll just have to take some alpha of maybe 10 and, and you're done, okay? So we haven't been able to show this yet in the lab because we haven't yet reached the regime where kappa 2 is bigger than everything else in the, in the system. 
Um, and the, the, the great news is that um, there is a whole um, literature, um, I hope growing literature, about what you do if I give you a qubit which only has one problem, like bit flips. So let's assume that by some mechanism, like this one I'm describing here, that I've completely suppressed phase flips and I give you a chip now which has a qubit. Okay, let's say more or less good bit flip rates, but only bit flip rates. Can you build an architecture which is uh, much less costly in resources that, um, that basically forms a quantum computer? And these papers here um, um, explain um, architectures that would do that, and this is called bi uh, qubits with biased noise, because um, it's biased in the sense that you, you have a much bigger rate of having, let's say, bit flips, the rates of having face flips. Okay, so this is sort of what we're trying to do now in the lab. And this is the implementation of, uh, the, the implementation is a research topic of um, uh, my PhD student, Rafael Escan, uh, who's running the experiments at, at ENS. And I'm just going to show you here some uh, preliminary results on the architecture where we're developing. Um, so we're, um, this again, so you, this again is, um, it's a similar architecture than before in the sense that you always have this LC oscillator, which is the storage mode, which, which will house the cat states and the quantum information and so on. You also have this low Q mode B, which is coupled to the transmission line, okay, like before. Uh, they're also, again, coupled through some nonlinear elements, with the which is a Joseph's injunction. And you also have this Wigner tomography apparatus, which is stuck on the, uh, which is on the backside of this LC oscillator here with the qubits and its readout resonator, okay? But this, let's say, is a, a experimental detail. Let's focus on here. And you see here, the, the, one of the great features of super, superconducting circuits is that basically uh, you, can in, in, uh, in, uh, you can basically take LCs and justice and junctions and play with them like Lego to engineer the Hamiltonian, a, a huge variety of Hamiltonians, right? So in our case, we wanted this uh, strong uh, three-wave mixing like A squared B dagger. And what we did is basically play around uh, the junctions and loops and so on in order to make the biggest G2 we could think of and in respect to all other um, terms in Hamiltonian, right? Um, okay, so what, what this would do if, if, um, if this works according to plan is that we could um, bias this squid with DC flux in a way that this behaves like an open, okay? So you can thread, um, you can basically put a magnetic field on top of this thing and it will thread magnetic flux through these loops and for a very specific value of the magnetic flux, this object here will behave like an open. If it's an open, you have two independent LC oscillators which do not couple at all in principle. And you're just in a situation like this, right? Where you just have two modes. That's epsilon equals zero. Now, epsilon here is the, 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 basically the drive I'm going to put on top of this operating point where this is an open. And uh, what this will do is that it will add this time-varying uh, parameter here up front in front of this H interaction. And this H interaction is basically a cosine of, of uh, the, 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 um, the, these operators phi A and phi B, which themselves are just basically um, a superposition of A and A dagger or B and B dagger for the B mode. Okay? Now, by controlling over the frequency at which I'm driving, this M omega A minus N omega B, I can select the, um, the uh, term in the Hamiltonian, which will, be, which will have the correct um, uh, sorry, frequency um, matching condition. And, for example, if I pump at m omega a mi minus n omega b, I should, in principle, build this interaction Hamiltonian here, where I annihilate m photons in A and create n photons in B. Okay? So this is what we did. This is what the chip looks like in, in practice. Uh, we moved to a 2D architecture um, and what I mean by 2D is that you're not seeing these big um, aluminum boxes anymore. Now everything is planar. Um, this is just a sample holder. These are connectors for me to plug in uh, cables. Um, uh, this is a PCB, it's just a printed circuit board, which is gold plated here. And this is now um, a silicon chip, okay? Uh, the silicon chip is recovered by about 100 nanometers of niobium, which is a um, a superconductor with a relatively high TC f for much better than aluminum, at least. Um, anyway, we, 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 like, uh, we like covering it with niobium. It gives good resonators. Um, and then here it's hard to see, but there are all these patterns, which I'm going to zoom in here. Um, these patterns here are what the real LC oscillator looks like. Okay, so 
this is the, so this is an LC oscillator. This is an LC oscillator. This is an LC oscillator. This is a qubit. And you see, we can use all the techniques used in nanofabrications for the um, semiconductor industry to basically build the chip like we want it, uh, having in mind the Hamiltonian that we want, right? So this is very much Hamiltonian engineering, right? Um, anyway, so there, there's a whole set of techniques we, we use to make these chips. And here's some preliminary results where, for example, we uh, can measure the frequencies of the, these two modes, right? The, the storage mode and the, uh, sorry, the storage mode and the buffer mode um, uh, as a function of uh, current in a coil, which is basically um, the, the current creates magnetic field, which threads flux through these loops. And you see, we think we understand, you know, well what's going on. We have a, a good agreement with, uh, with the, the theory. Um, and you see these um, two, the, the, this beating here with fast oscillations and slow oscillations. Um, the, the fast oscillations uh, are due to the big loop that is formed by the two inductors of the LC oscillators. And the slow oscillations is due to the flux going through the squid, the, the little um, parallel junctions that you see in the middle. And what we want to do is operate around here. So if we go and sit here, this is the case where the two systems are decoupled. And we're going to go around this point here and oscillate the flux around this specific point. Okay, and hopefully something exciting will happen. Um, so this is what we've done here. On the x-axis, you have the, the probe frequency of um, a certain resonator. On the y-axis, you have a, a, the pump frequency. So this, uh, so it's epsilon, the epsilon I showed before. We're just varying its frequency here. And you see that, um, so the, this uh, dip here just shows the resonant frequency of the of one of the modes. This, here is the buffer mode, right? And you see when we hit exactly two uh, omega a minus omega b, you have an anti-crossing. And this anti-crossing um, gives us information about how big G2 we made. And from if, if we believe this is due to this process here, this G2 of the order of many megahertz, okay? Uh, which is uh, about, um, so before we had about uh, 100, 200 kilohertz. So this is, um, this is actually a, a, a times 30 with respect to what we were able to, to make before. Uh, we can also go and tune our pump frequency around um, other frequency matching conditions and sweep it through the 3 omega a minus omega b uh, frequency matching condition. And you'll get this sort of term. And here I have not quoted a number, but you can see something going on. And we, it's consistent with this frequency anyway. So more, more data needs to be taken to confirm these things and so on. Okay, so uh, just to conclude, um, I've, um, I'm, the, 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 uh, the question I'm trying to answer in this research is whether or not there are other ways of encoding quantum information in the uh, superconducting circuit in such a way that we reduce the overhead used, uh, needed for quantum error correction. Um, our, um, the way we want to do this is first by encoding information in a cavity, which is economical in terms of uh, hardware. Um, but it also, we also introduce errors by um, uh, sort of attaching measurement apparatuses and so on. And we think this should be very efficiently, and by very efficiently I mean exponentially uh, suppressed by this, the, the feature of the nonlinear dissipation here. Um, okay, so, so if, if we succeed in making this uh, building block, maybe it could be the um, you know, building block for some repetition code, for modular architecture, for a surface code. And maybe it would look something like this. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>